this book, we believe, is from God. And we believe that this book has authority over our lives. That, that when our thoughts are different from this book, that we need to repent, confess, and bring ourselves back in alignment with God's will. So the, the book is over us. Now, today, our culture that we live in, this country we love, is telling us that homosexuality is not a sin. In fact, even beyond that, we're, as a culture, we're, we're putting a stamp of approval on it. It's kind of a cool thing. And I've even seen parents, uh, when they believe they have a, a gay child, kind of take pride in that. I always knew my son was special, as it's, as it's something to revel in. If we go there, if we decide to do that, and, and if the Bible does indeed say that sex outside of marriage, including gay sex, is a sin, then what happens? This book is no longer our authority. This is very important. Brothers and sisters, uh, we need to think about this uh, deeply. And so today's uh, message is uh, gay marriage, a response. And I would like to thank Pastor John Hopler for the wealth of information he sent out this week on today's topic. According to a press release issued by the National Association of Evangelicals this last Wednesday, the Supreme Court ruled on two significant marriage cases on Wednesday, deeming Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, that was DOMA, you've heard of that, which provided for the federal laws, marriage refers to the union of one man and one woman, they decided that was unconstitutional. And ruling that California's Proposition 8 defenders did not have legal standing. It was kind of an interesting thing. Uh, what they did was with DOMA was say that uh, when states decided to endorse gay marriage, and it, then that the federal government had to recognize that. So that's an interesting issue, because the federal government is federal law, the state is state law. However, they were allowing individual states to then dictate to the federal government how they would interpret marriage. So it's a bizarre situation now that if you're in a state that endorses gay marriage, you can get federal benefits. But if you're in a state that doesn't, you can't. Uh, it's, it, so again, they were having state laws trump federal law, and, it, and it's not really been going that way in the past, uh, usually. And then the second thing they did with Proposition 8, which you've heard about out of California all the time, was that the government, the, the law was passed by the people and, uh, uh, to define marriage uh, in a traditional way, and the, the, uh, the governor and the, the state decided not to enforce the law. And so nobody was there to enforce the law, so a coalition of of uh, a collection of peoples got together and tried to take it to court and the Supreme Court said basically you don't have the right to represent your state. So they didn't really decide one way or another but the, 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 rea the result is that gay marriage will now go forward in, uh, in California by just ignoring the law that they themselves passed. Uh, so today I want to talk about, I want to respond to this massive cultural shift that we're seeing on the issue of homosexuality in our lifetimes, and actually just in the last, really, 10 years, uh, American culture has taken a big swing. In fact, some sociologists are saying that this is one of the most dynamic changes in moral opinion uh, in history. I would probably like the 1960s and the sexual revolution. This is just a huge upheaval of the way our culture is uh, understanding homosexuality. And there's two reasons I want to talk about it. Uh, one is so that you know where our church stands. Uh, it's important because I know Christians say, well, but I've got family members that are gay. What am I supposed to do with that? And, and well, quick answer, love them, you know, that that doesn't change. But people, people, uh, people often say, well, where does my church believe? What do we believe? And people can come to church and have good Christian people and say, well, I just want to love people, so I don't want to say it's wrong not understanding again that when we put our culture's definition of morality above this, then God is no longer our authority. So it's important that we talk about these things because good-hearted, kind, wonderful Christian people, uh, maybe right here in our church, can sometimes uh, be thinking about this in a way that's not entirely biblical. So I want to run through that. The second reason 
is uh, I'm actually directing this uh, message towards the greater community, those out there, uh, those in Janesville. Uh, people want to know, well, what does your church believe? Where does your church stand? And a lot of times this is kind of a litmus test in, uh, well, if you accept gay people, well, then you're cool, you're in. And so I just want to be very, very honest as a church. And I would rather tell you straightforward what we believe, and you could say, oh, yeah, well, I don't believe that. And, and, and I'd rather have you just know it than kind of hedge it and, and be deceptive in some way and, and try to go around. That's not what we're all about. Here, I'm just going to tell you what we believe, and, and, uh, and I encourage you to take it to God and, and pray about it. And, and if, if after you search the scriptures and you prayed, Lord God, please show me what you teach about sex outside of marriage, and if you come and say, you know, I'm not going to be part of your church because I don't think the Bible says. If that's where you stand, that's between you and the Lord, okay? That's between you and God. But I just want to encourage you to be honest about it and to approach these scriptures and be prayerful and say, God, just teach me. I don't want to bring my culture's perception to scriptures. I want you to teach me your heart and your will. So, so please uh, just be honest with yourself, be honest with God, and deal with the scriptures as open-mindedly uh, and directly as we can. Uh, what we believe, and I'm not speaking for all Christians. I don't want to, I can't take that burden, uh, and I know that wouldn't be true anyways. Uh, what we believe at Foundation Bible Church, what we've looked in here and what we believe to be true, uh, may be extraordinarily unpopular. Uh, we may be uh, what many modern people would say, out of step with uh, the movement of history. Uh, well, Jesus, he didn't win any popularity contests either. And if your main goal of coming to church is so you can be in the in crowd and be popular, uh, well, you, you may be disappointed. One of the Supreme Court justices said, uh, he was talking about animus or, or hatred, he said, in effect, he said, in effect, that only hate would... would uh, the only reason somebody would oppose gay marriage is because of hate. Wow. Well, what is, I don't, you know, what do you do with that? I don't, that's quite an assumption. I mean, you're broad brushing an entire category of people and, uh, and denigrating other cultures, denigrating all of American history up to this point. Uh, and in, in you search your heart and say, Lord God, am I being hateful? Because I don't want to. I want to love people. And you think, well, Lord God, I sure don't feel like I'm hating anybody. But a Supreme Court justice has said, if you're opposed to gay marriage, it must be because of hatred. And I want you to think about that and remember that what kind of speech is illegal in the United States? Hate speech. And so I was listening to some... Uh, uh, Christians talk this week, uh, some uh, very educated people. One was the head of, uh, well, we'll talk about him more later, but he was the head of, uh, for the Southern Baptist, head of their uh, ethics and the way they interact with culture. And he pointed out that a lot of times Christians have gotten involved in this black copter stuff and been run around saying, oh, no, the world's ending, the world's ending. And the government, he said, some Christians have done this so often, they're going to miss the fact that this really is serious. This really is a dangerous situation. Uh, already, prior to these rulings, remember just recently, Catholic adoption agencies in Massachusetts had to go out of business. They had been there to help children without mommies and daddies find loving parents. They had to go out of business because the state tried to tell them, you have to adopt out children to families with two dads or two moms. And they said, no, our faith, our conscience, what we believe deep down inside, we just, we just think the best place for these children is with a mom and a dad that, you know, a traditional family uh, structure. And the state told them no. And so they went out of business. And there was another story. I mean, there's plenty of stories out there, but another story about a, a flower business that, that uh, they provide flowers to weddings. And they, they wanted to provide flowers to traditional weddings. And when they didn't provide it to a, to, a, to a gay couple, they got in trouble with the government because of that decision. Uh, so 
brothers and sisters, something bizarre has happened here. It's kind of weird. The right to have sex with a same-sex partner is now trumping the constitutionally protected right to religious freedom. You might say, oh, come on, you're taking it too far. What do you mean? No, it's kind of weird. And I'm going I'm to walk you through this because the right to have sex with somebody of the same sex is not in the Constitution. The right to express our religious freedom is constitutionally mandated. And yet, that freedom is now taken like a second-class citizen. That's a lower kind of freedom than the right to uh, homosexual sex. Freedom of conscience, freedom to practice our faith as we see fit, is now a value below the right to homosexual activity. Think of it this way. I mean, it's a simple exercise. Think about this. Many, many people today live with people they love, but they don't enjoy the legal benefits of marriage. Well, that's not right. If, if they love each other, why shouldn't they? Well, wait, follow me. They live with people they love, but they don't have the legal benefits of marriage. For example, adult children with their parents. Long-term relationship. They love each other. But the state doesn't give them the legal benefit of marriage because they're not married. Or how about a pair of old bachelors? Maybe brothers, maybe friends, just sharing an apartment together. Maybe they've been living together for 20, 30 years. Or an, uh, they don't have the benefit of marriage. Or an old, I mean, let's, I mean, there's so many situations. An old neighbor that you've moved in with, you're taking care of them. An old teacher, a college teacher that was a mentor to you, and, and now in his old age, you're taking care of this person. You're living together. You love each other. All of these were intimate relationships. People living together, loving each other, all long term, but they don't have the right to share insurance policies. They don't have the right to share medical benefits. They don't have the same legal standing as marriage. The difference, sex. The difference is sex. They aren't having it. Before, we could say the difference was that these people weren't married. Now we've changed the definition of marriage. So what is the difference? How are two friends together, two brothers living together for 30, 40 years, different than a gay couple who now share the benefits well, one is this, these people are engaged in homosexual sex, and this one they aren't. They're both together. They both love each other. They're both long-term relationships. So in a bizarre twist that past generations of Americans could never have predicted, the new right to have state-sanctioned homosexual relationship has trumped, again, has already done so in many cases, freedom of conscience. Freedom, religious freedom. So how should Christians respond? Well, we need to pray. On one level, the ruling actually changes nothing. Before the ruling, we just want to love people. And we just want to bring them close to Jesus Christ. After the ruling, boy, we just want to love people. And we just want to bring them close to Jesus Christ. Win people's hearts for the Lord. Let them know that there's a good God. He died for their sins. The heaven's doors are wide open. And if we would just repent and say, Lord God, forgive. He is quick to forgive. Let's populate heaven. That was our job before and after this ruling. Then, you know, of course, we've been given, uh, we need to be wise stewards of our money. We need to be wise stewards of our vote. In this country, we're blessed with uh, political freedom. We need to exercise our freedoms and let our voices be heard. And, and here's something important, not only for people who think like us, but to protect everybody's right to freedom of conscience, even if they disagree with us. And we, not, we want to, don't only want to protect Christian faith, but we want to protect Jews and Muslims and people of other faiths who feel that their religious freedom is being eroded in the face of this paradigm shift on uh, homosexuality. Government needs to enforce the Constitution, and it needs to protect the rights of the minority against the will of the majority. Otherwise, the majority can, can become a tyranny. We have religious freedom. We, we need to hold on to that. It's precious. People don't know in the history of the world how rare freedom of conscience to speak and to pray and believe as you see fit. That's a rare, rare commodity. And once we lose it, it's hard to get back. Took bloodshed to get it the first time. 
So hard to get freedom, so easy to lose it, and then how do you ever get it back? But there's something else we need to do, brothers and sisters, Christians. We've got a lot of repenting to do. We have to repent. I don't know if our culture has always seen Christianity at its best. I think our culture often sees us as this controlling force that wants to force other people to act and behave like we do, even though they don't believe what we do. We need to repent of that. I can, I can remember growing up, and this is to my shame, and I take no pleasure in this, I used words like queen and queer and, and gay and fag and, in such a way that they were hurtful. I used them as derogatory kind of cuss words. Uh, and it just hurts me now to think if somebody was struggling with their sexual identity, and I'm using this struggle and making light of it and mocking and putting other people down, what a miserable person I am. I haven't done that for decades, and I'm ashamed that I ever did. Uh, we need to repent. We need to repent of making people feel like they're second class or unloved or rejected by the cross of Jesus Christ because they're struggling with sin. Hello, so am I. We need to repent when we hear on the news about violence against the gay community and we say, well, that's wrong, but we kind of give it a pass. It's not that bad. Violence against anybody. We need to repent of seeing people in the gay community as the enemy. They're not my enemy. The devil is my enemy. The devil wants to deceive people. He wants to drag people to hell. People who have political views different than mine, they're not my enemy. People who have moral views different than mine, they are not my enemy. Jesus Christ died for me, and he died for them. And if Jesus loves them, and I see them as my enemy, what is wrong with me? Where is my heart? And how unchristian. Brothers and sisters, repent. Sinners need the cross. And if we are so full of ourselves that we can't love sinners, how are they going to get the cross? If we don't love sinners, you're not going to love anybody in this room. You're not going to love me. You're not going to love yourself. Jesus Christ died for his, the Bible says, enemies. Jesus Christ loves people who are opposed to him. And so should we. We need to repent of soft attitudes towards premarital sex. We need to repent of soft attitudes towards divorce and, and this acceptance of single-parent homes. The Bible says God hates divorce. God hates divorce. God hates it. But American Christianity has, has far too often we make excuses for premarital sex. It's okay. You know, it's a sin in the Bible. And we make excuses for divorce. And then we turned right around and shook our fingers at people who struggle with different sins. What a bunch of hypocrites we are. Hypocrites. Divorce is okay. Adultery, wink. Premarital sex, fine. But those gay people, and we, we quiver and shake as if their sin is so disgusting. When my sin put Jesus Christ on the cross, all sin is degradation. All sin is filth. And who are we to give a pass to our pet sins and then to point figures at somebody else's sin? Five, we need to repent, brothers and sisters. The church is not supposed to go somewhere way out on the prairie, way out in the Arctic Circle, so we can just be a holy huddle of people who think just like us. We can create this nice little atmosphere. We need to repent about wanting to protect our little subculture, not wanting to soil our churches with difficult people, different people, those people then we care about loving lost souls into heaven. Did you follow me? Oh, we don't want people like that here. 
what my, it will upset my children. We need to have a place that's safe for children, using, hiding behind our kids. Hiding behind our kids so that we have an excuse to exclude people that Jesus Christ is trying to bring in. We need to repent. This means having to have uncomfortable talks with our children. Good. It's worth it. So that we can show that God's love is big. And the grace of Jesus Christ can cover the sins of anybody who comes to him and repents and says, Lord God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Our children need to know that God's love is bigger than sin. We're a church. A church is a rescue mission. We are not a social club. We're not just here to be with people who are just like us. We're out there to rescue people, bring them close to Jesus. And we need to repent of the urge to just go along with the flow. Our culture's mood swings. Cultures have mood swings. And right now our culture says, oh, homosexuality, that's cool. Well, I want to I wanna be with the hip kids. I want to be popular. We need to repent of that desire to fit in. Brothers and sisters, you're not supposed to fit in. You're supposed to be different. Do not be like our culture. <coughs> if the Bible says it's against the character of God, then it is sin, period. And if we compromise that, then again, we've drawn a wedge between God's authority and ourselves we're not a social club. Again, we're church. We don't need to be cool. Thank goodness. We need to hold out the cross of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. It says, here is salvation. Here's forgiveness of sins. Here's how you have peace with Christ. Get on your knees. Repent. Stop making excuses for your sin. Stop saying it's okay. It's not. If it was okay, Jesus would not have had to die. We don't want to go along with the flow. A bunch of lemmings jump off the cliff. We don't have to do it too. We need to repent. So what have I done so far this morning? Well, if you're on a certain kind of mindset and you're on the far right somewhere and you're offended that Foundation Church wants to love and welcome everybody, even those guys, even people like that, if you are upset that we want to love and bring into our church people who are honestly trying to find God regardless of whatever sin they're struggling with, you know what? I can live with that because I'm not sure you're following the same Jesus I'm following. My Jesus died on the cross for messed up people, broken on the inside. And he calls us to love people the way he did. Love everybody. So if you're offended by what we believe here, fine. Fine. <laughs> Go talk with the Lord, see if you're wrong. And if you're listening to this and you're somewhere off on the left side of where we're at and you're thinking, man, this church does not know how to follow the crowd. Oh, that's, that's kind of a, a way of saying we're not in step with the times, right? They're not a bunch of lemmings. What is wrong with this church? They don't, don't they know that their views are ancient? Yeah, that's kind of the point. Don't they know the popular kids won't like them? Well, I can live with that, too, because our goal is to be pleasing to the Lord and not to be people pleasers. We're not here to be popular. We're here to show people how you can get saved, how you can walk in truth, how you can know that there's a God who cares for you and loves you and will take you just as you are. And seven, we need to repent of doing marriage the way the culture does I was listening to one Christian. He said, uh, Christians have been guilty of saying marriage is just a stamp of approval on two people's love for each other. He said, no, it's not. Marriage is a symbol of the relationship between the church and Jesus Christ. And we change our marriage vows and say, we'll stay together as long as love endures. When we take God out of the equation, we, do cult, we, do, we just do, oh, we, we have a lot of emotion. Therefore, we should be married what right do we turn, have to turn around and say, gay people have a lot of emotion for each other, but yours doesn't count. Our emotion is better than your emotion. See, we were guilty of doing marriage the world's way. Marriage God's way, you can't fit into the culture because it's counter-cultural. 
Marriage God's way is always going to be about God first. Put God in the middle. And as we grow closer to God, a husband and wife will grow closer to each other. Ethicist, ethicist Russell Moore said, Every marriage, and he's talking about done God's way, every marriage is a gospel tract. Don't you like that? When people see forgiveness and persistence, and I don't run away because marriage is hard, I don't give up because marriage is hard, it shows Jesus Christ to a lost world. Forgive, love, and stick with it because that's what God does to us, with us. Everything we do is a moral issue. Either we're making Christ attractive, I want to make Christ attractive with my life, and we're bringing him glory, or we're not. So this is, those are some of the things we need to repent of. Now I want to look at some of the pitfalls that should we, we should avoid. So this is where the things we should repent of, now here's some things that we should avoid. Assumptions that we shouldn't make. Number one, this is the beginning of the end of Christianity in America. Uh, no, it's not. It is not the end of Christianity in America. The gospel could flourish under Nero. You think the gospel can flourish underneath a few Supreme Court decisions that we don't like? The gospel can flourish in communist nations. The gospel can flourish under deadly persecution. The church can grow when the culture is violently opposed to it. This is not the end of Christianity in America. Unless we stop loving people and we become a holy huddle and we retreat and withdraw. The second assumption, there's an assumption in America, there's an assumption in America, and it, I see where it comes from, and there's, like everything, there's a little grain, there's something good there, but there's this belief in America that as Americans, we are a wise and good people, therefore we're better than other cultures, and since we're growing in wisdom, apparently, we're better than previous cultures, other cultures and previous generations thought that gay marriage was wrong, but we're smarter than them. Well, see that? There's a basic assumption of superiority in our generation. Homosexuality, guess what? It didn't just start 10 years ago. It's been around since the fall, since the dawn of humanity. It, it's been around in, in every human, it's been around all over the globe and in every culture. The ancient Greeks even praised homosexuality in some contexts, and they legally in, acknowledged and endorsed homosexual unions, especially between men and boys. But they never called it marriage. They, they knew it wasn't marriage. In fact, the vast majorities of cultures throughout the ages, the vast, we're talking above 99.9%, .9%, there's been no such thing as gay marriage. They, they recognized homosexuality. Many cultures saw it as a sin. Some cultures didn't for periods of time. The Greeks struggled back and forth with it. Sometimes they called it the, the most filthy and horrible sin, and sometimes they elevated it. They were at war with themselves with that. But, so most cultures saw it as sinful, but even in cultures that accept it, nobody called it marriage. And now in 10 years, we're smarter than all these other cultures. Our culture is better than all these previous generations. Leith Anderson, uh, president of the National Association of Evangelicals, who we were blessed to hear speak uh, last week, wrote that human history in every culture has defined marriage as the enduring and intimate relationship of a man and a woman. This definition has established the primary expression of family. True, different cultures and chapters of history have encouraged and endorsed varying expressions of marriage, but nothing like those in our generation who are proposing a redefinition of marriage. So if, real quick, what does a redefinition mean? Well, people, uh, when I spoke at, where was it? Blackhawk? Was that Blackhawk or Urock? Blackhawk. Uh, in this forum where we were talking about homosexuality, some people say, why are you denying the right for gay people to marry? And I said, I'm not. Because marriage means a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. I said, they don't want to marry. But see, now we've reframed the argument, so we define marriage as any two people who want to be together. So uh, we've redefined what the term means. Leith then goes on to quote Jesus, who explains Jesus, who explained marriage himself by quoting the Old Testament, Genesis 2.24. Jesus said, haven't you heard? Don't you guys know? 
that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The institution of marriage didn't come from culture. It came from God. Human culture that has been around for thousands of years is now being swept aside rapidly. That's hubris. It kind of, kind of looks like arrogance. I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm talking about human culture. Thousands of years of human culture is being swept aside, and at the heart is this assumption that we're wiser than previous generations and we're better than other cultures. In fact, they are morally inferior to us because they're not endorsing gay marriage the way we are. And that strikes me as something that we should be very, very careful about. The Bible teaches us, brothers and sisters, that we're not basically good. We're not innately a wise and good people. We're a fallen people. And the Bible also tells us that we should not be quick to change ancient boundary lines. They're there. Our forefathers set these lines down for a reason. The third assumption is that we're defined by our sexual orientation. People say, how can I say homosexuality is a sin? I'd be denying myself. And what are they doing? They're defining themselves by their sexual activity. We are not defined by our sexual orientation. Not if there's a God. So you have to deal with that issue, you know, figure out yourself if there's a God or not. If there's a God, then our definition, our primary definition of who we are as people, if there's a God, then who you enjoy having sex with is not the most important thing about you. It's not what defines you. The most important thing about you is where you stand in relationship to God Almighty. Our identity is found in Jesus Christ who loved us enough to die for us and said, come unto me. Everybody is weary and messed over and heavy. He says, and I will give you rest. And now my identity, I'm a forgiven person. My identity is I'm a child of the king. We don't define ourselves by, by uh, who am I? I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, we, may, we all may be greedy. We all may be drunkards. I'm not saying we are. But, uh, but we don't define ourselves by that. We define ourselves by our relationship to Jesus Christ. Uh, Galatians 3, uh, 26 through 29, you are all sons of God. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We're putting on Christ. Christ, his character covers us. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Did you hear that? So I want to plead with you. Don't define yourself by your sexual orientation, what you perceive to be your sexual orientation, especially if this Bible is true. In sex outside of marriage, homosexual sex included, is a sin, then defining yourself by your sin would be a great tragedy. God wants you to define yourself as somebody loved by him. If you don't belong to Christ, if, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant. We're all part of the same family, heirs according to promise. Number four, uh, connected to number three, is I can't deny myself. Uh, maybe this is another one we Christians need to repent of too. People say, I can't become a Christian because I'd have to deny myself. You know, as Christians, we need to repent of this one too because too often we present a faith to people. Come to Jesus and you get everything you want. You have an urge, God will fulfill it. You have a want, a desire, name it and claim it. Meanwhile, the Bible says we do need to deny ourselves. Jesus, in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So yes, my friends, if you're struggling with homosexuality and you say you can't deny yourself, if you want to be the disciple of Jesus Christ, you must deny this element. And, if, and there are so many things, Christians, <coughs> wants and urges in, our, in your heart, and we've often put a religious stamp of approval on it. No, we need to learn how to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. 
And then in Matthew 20, uh, 19, 29, Jesus gives us this encouragement. Tremendous encouragement. Because if I'm denying myself, and, and maybe because of following Jesus Christ, this has happened to many people, because of following Jesus Christ, I'm not working on Sunday. Or maybe I'm not doing what my boss likes because he wants me to work on Sunday. I might even lose my job. We may have a worst financial situation because we're, not, we're going to deny our desire for wealth and we're going to put Christ first. We need some promise from the Lord. We could lose friends, family members because we put God first. Jesus said, everyone who had to leave behind their home, everyone who lost a brother or a sister or a father or a mother or even a wife or a child or fields, and they lost them because of me, Jesus is saying, for my sake, that person will receive a hundred times as much in the life to come. So yeah, sometimes we lose a lot. There's a lot to deny. There's a lot to leave behind to follow Jesus Christ. Here's the good news. God's going to bless you. He's going to pour out his love on you. You're going to be forgiven. You're going to have eternal life. You're going to have eternal life in heaven. And we're not going to have these internal conflicts and these struggles anymore. God can be trusted. He died for us. We can, we can trust him with our souls. Number five, the last assumption that we need to guard against is the idea that if you disagree with somebody, it means you hate them. Just because you disagree with somebody does not mean you hate them. We should remember that people who don't think the way we do, for the most part, for the most part, they honestly believe that they're doing the right thing. We, we like to talk about the gay agenda. Guess what? Most people who are promoting the gay agenda, they think they're making a better world. Can you admit that? Let's not assume the worst about people. Now, now we believe that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> that they won't make a better world. Uh, they're doing it all wrong. They, that the world would, uh, a better world starts with repentance and faith in God. It doesn't start with a rejection of God's will and a fierce defiance uh, not to confess our sins, but that doesn't change the fact that most people who support this big change on homosexuality, they really do think they're loving. They want to be warm and accepting to their friends and their family. And they think that just saying, don't worry about that, it's okay, is the, is the best thing they can do for them. Don't assume the worst about people because they think differently than we do. And on the other side, I want to say, if you're one of the people who are, who are really promoting our, our seat changes, cultural change in homosexuality, I want to try, say, uh, try to see it my way. Uh, do I have to, to keep on talking uh, till I can't go on? While you see it your way, run the risk of knowing that our love may soon be gone. Uh, seriously, uh, as Beatles, uh, seriously, it's hard to understand a different culture. And what I'm talking about this morning is going to look like a different culture to you. Uh, it, it, try to imagine it, though, from our perspective. Why do you think so many Christians oppose the idea that culture and government should put a stamp of approval on homosexuality? What's, instead of just saying, what's wrong with them? They're full of hate. Try to think, why... Do we say, no, we don't want to approve this? Here's a hint. The cross. The Bible says that you and I, that on the inside we're all broken because of sin. Sin is that which is opposed to the character of God. Uh, God is good. God is loving. God is beautiful. He's holy. He's wonderful. And on the inside, there's something in us that just wants to rebel against that. The problem is when we rebel against goodness and love and beauty, we're walking away from goodness. Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for my sin and your sin. So here's why we can't approve of homosexuality. If we tell you it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, you're not going to know you need to repent. And you could miss out on heaven. It's hard to understand where other people are coming from, but I hope, even if you disagree with me, I hope you can see that before God, I want to love you. I want to love people. 
And we believe that God is quick to forgive and he will forgive if we would come to him in faith. See, I often hear people on the other side of this issue from me. They accuse people like me of being hateful. In fact, remember uh, years ago there was a, a letter in the Gazette I shared with you this po before. Uh, Pastor Dan hates people because of my position that homosexuality is a sin. There, it's right there for the whole city. Pastor Dan hates people. And, and a columnist in, in the Gazette, what am I supposed to do with that? I, I prayed, God, I, I don't think I'm hating anybody. Uh, but God, if I am, please reveal it to me. And recently a columnist in the Gazette uh, said that he believes that people like me, he was an intelligent man, he has his own nationally syndicated column, in some ways a brilliant man, he said that people like me want to round up the gay community and exile them, put them behind big, community, uh, big walls and leave them to die. And I read that and I thought, no, no. The exact opposite is true. Please listen. If you consider yourself gay or, or you're, you're an ally of, of, of your homosexual friends, I need you to hear this. I want, I want to spend eternity with you. I don't want to round you up and separate you. I want you to be in heaven with me. We want you to be with us. We don't want to exile you. And when I say we, and again, I can't speak for all Christians, I'm just speaking for our group here, I mean sinners. We mean sinners who have found grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He died for us, and he died for your sins too. And we can be one family. We can be one family for eternity we're, because we're united at the foot of the cross. We're each bowing and confessing how messed up we are, how selfish, how greedy, how hard-headed, how you know, self-righteous, full of lust, and all these nasty things inside of us, and yet we all come before the cross and say, God, you're so good to forgive us. Thank you, and we love you, and we want to be more like you, and we want to live your way. Please give us your truth and your love. My prayer is that you will know the deep love of God, a love of God that is so consuming, there's no longer all this fears and doubts and worries in the inside, that you can let it all go and just luxuriate and bathe in the grace of God. That is my prayer for you. It's not that you be exiled. Those of you who have felt rejected, you felt rejected by the culture, you felt unloved by Christians, or you were part of a church maybe that, that couldn't accept you because of how you feel oriented sexually, I want to invite you to Foundation Bible Church. We would love to have you. We would love to have you. Paraphrasing Russell Moore, the ethicist again, if you're struggling with your sexual identity, I want you to know you're not a freak. You're not unwanted. God hasn't turned his back on you. Jesus loves you. He died for my sins and yours. I want you to know something else. Again, if you consider yourself gay or a champion or an ally of the gay community, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I need the grace of God. And so are you. And you don't get a pass on your sin. I have to repent of my sin, and you need to repent of your sin. You don't get a pass because popular culture says it's okay. What matters is not what popular culture says. It matters what God says, if indeed there's a God. If there's a heaven and there's a hell, we better get right with God. Your sin is not special. We all fall short of God. We all need that grace. <coughs> just because people are applauding, just because culture is approving, doesn't mean a thing. It matters what God has to say. If you want peace, if you want peace with God, if any of us want peace with God, we have to stop defending ourselves and agree with him about our lives. The Bible tells us, this is beautiful, times of refreshing blow into our weary souls when we just say, God, I'm wrong. I'm not going to defend myself anymore. I'm not going to fight with you anymore. Lord God, I confess my sin. Let your, let your love blow into my heart. I hope that everyone hearing this message today will know the joy of being forgiven. It's a good thing to know you're messed up and nasty, and then to know that God loves you, 
and he's going to hold you to his side, and he's not going to divorce his children. He's not going to turn his back to you to know that you are forgiven completely. I hope you can know that joy. And we first, to receive forgiveness, we first have to know that we need to be forgiven. Amen? And I pray that you will know that joy. Peace comes when we stop fighting with God. We let him come into our lives. We let God come in, and we let God teach us a new way of living because his ways are better than our ways. His, his ways are always going to be better than our ways, and it's better than what our culture says, too. Don't fall for the lie. The devil wants to separate you from the authority of God. The devil wants you to be approved by culture and end up separated from holy God. We need to fall on our knees before God and just ask for forgiveness. Let's pray. And I, I invite you all to pray with me now. Those watching on the internet or on television too, please just pray with me now a short prayer so we can get right with the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we all come to you with different sins. Lord, we're, we all fall short. We don't want to compare ourselves to others and feel superior or self-righteous or better than other people. Lord, we just see ourselves and we know we need your love. We need your forgiveness. So we want to say, God, thank you for Jesus Christ coming to, to earth to reach down into this muck and this mire to grab a hold of us and lift us out, to die, to pay the penalty of all the nasty things we've said or thought or done, completely paid, 100% paid on the cross. Lord, thank you for the cross. Lord, right now, together, we want to say, Lord, we want to follow you. We want to be followers of Jesus Christ. We want to follow you every single day of our lives. Teach us, Lord God. Open up our minds. Help us to see what it means to love people the way you do. Help us, Lord, to live by your truth, to acknowledge that your ways are better than our ways and much better than our own ways. Look where we've gotten ourselves. And, Lord, we just want to say thank you for loving us, even when we didn't want to love you, even when we want to turn our back on you. God, thank you for that divine, supernatural love and help us to learn to love people that way too. Lord God, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross but then rose again to prove that you keep all your promises, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.